So for this particular video, I wanted to do a video about 77 tips that box cutter users may or may not know. So hopefully users are able to approach this as a drinking game of sorts, where maybe you'll be able to take a shot every time you hear a tip that you were previously unaware of. But without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into this. So whenever it comes to starting box cutter, after you install it, you can always click on the icon in the active tools in order to activate the active tool known as box cutter. By pressing the icon, you can also press W to exit or basically change you to select as your active tool instead. So anytime you want to exit box cutter, you can always just press W. In addition to being able to click the icon over here in the T panel in order to start box cutter, in the end panel, there's a tab for box cutter where we can find the box cutter tab and click on the word activate box cutter. Now we'll also activate box cutter. So between these, there are three different ways you can start box cutter. You can just click on the active tool icon, you can click on the word activate box cutter, or you can use the hotkey Alt W. And either way, you'll be started and ready to go. Whenever it comes to box cutter, you can change your operation in the top bar. There's a quick switch to allow you to go from cut to knife just on the fly. You can change your shape on the fly and go inside of it to adjust shape specific options in addition to drawing from corner or center draw. You can also toggle between line box and regular box in this, as well as toggle other tools such as Ngon between drawing as a line and drawing as a closed shape. Next to that, we have options for specifying your origin. You can also specify your modifier starting type for if you want to draw starting with a bevel, start with a mirror, start with a taper present, or start with a ray. Whenever it comes to orientation, we have options for users to quickly get in and adjust their orientation and even toggle between drawing exclusively in view if desired. There's options for snapping where you can toggle between dots and grid just by toggling these options as well as turn snapping off. There's an option for non-destructive and then there's an option for applying your modifiers. So in the event that you want to apply modifiers, there's an apply button directly at the top of the top bar in addition to being able to adjust various behaviors and parameters inside the behavior panel and the ability to work in live or have your balloons take place after the draw operation is complete in order to preserve your speed. Whenever it comes to understanding what version of box cutter you're using, just hovering over the active tool icon will display the version information. Once we click on it, we see that the information for the version is also listed at the very top of the top bar. If we press N to bring open the end panel and we're in the box cutter tab, we also see that we have the version info displayed at the top. Anytime you're following a tutorial, make sure that your version is at least the same or later than the version that you see displayed in the top bar. But our goal with displaying the version info is to make it as accessible as possible for users to quickly find out what version they need and whether or not they need to update. While the current top bar shown is optimized for information conveyance and mouse usage, if we press F4 and we bring up our preferences, we can access our preferences and underneath the display tab are options pertaining to the top bar. So there is a degree of customization. For example, you can turn off simple top bar, which will actually show icons for every operation and for every shape, allowing you more toggles to be accessible whenever you're working inside of box cutter. However, most of the time we have it consolidated down to a simple version, just allowing things to be a little bit more sane. Also, the labels can be toggled off and on, as you see, where you can actually get a very short and concise version of box cutter going and the labels aren't displaying. The labels are actually there to assist with users of box cutter following tutorials with understanding exactly what's going on with operations. The first icon in the top bar of box cutter is the helper, basically making the rest of the top bar redundant. Through the helper, you can actually configure the majority of things that are integral to your box cutter experience. For example, I could quickly jump over to circle, make sure I'm on 32 segments, and also activate bevel as my start state, turning off Q bevel or turning it on if I want. And then from there, I could even go back and activate snapping since I didn't activate snapping. And we see that we're set to dots, meaning when I hold control, I now have dots and I'm able to draw in a shape that's beveled already. And we could even click on this icon to go back in and reverse the bevel to give us a reverse bevel. And we could drag these dots in order to adjust the operation, clicking to complete it. When starting out with box cutter, it's important to be aware, aware of your mode, aware of your shape, aware of your orientation, aware of your start state, aware of your snapping, aware of whether they're working destructive or non-destructive. If we begin drawing on the surface, we will do a surface oriented draw. 
If we begin drawing off of the surface, we'll be doing a view align based draw, meaning that we are drawing not oriented to the surface, but oriented to the current view that we're looking in. In addition to this, we also have notifications inside of the end panel option for box cutter to let users know that they need to select a mesh to cut. So if you're new to box cutter, having the end panel may be assistive since some users sometimes can struggle with not having their meshes selected in order to cut, wondering why their cuts come out as makes. So make sure that you select your object that you want to cut. And when it comes to drawing on a surface, you want to start what you're drawing on the surface to do a surface oriented cut, or else you will draw a view based cut. So once box cutter is active via us clicking the icon in the T panel, help is accessible from a variety of locations. For example, if we press N, we see that there's help located on the side. And as we begin drawing shapes, we see that more help information is being displayed to let us know what we're able to do during this particular operation. In addition to showing in the end panel, help is also accessible under the active tool and workspace settings where basically it behaves the exact same where basically it starts off simple and then as you use it it begins to expand more and more to give you more information as to what is available to you. In addition to help showing in the end panel but also showing in the active tool and workspace settings we can also access help whenever we're working in full screen. So let's say that we're working completely in full screen but we had only the top bar showing. Well, in the event that we need to see our hotkeys just on the fly, just clicking the help icon will display a help that you can review just real quick and will fade away whenever you move your mouse, just in the event that you need to just access help very quickly and you're working in a full screen state. Keep in mind that there's additional functions attached to the help icon where basically shift clicking it will take you to the documentation and control clicking it will take you to the hops cutter discord community. In order to be a little more conveying with hops and what we're doing with that, for example, if we press Q and we run Sharpen, we see that Sharpen has a small notification that displays at the bottom. If we were to press Q and we ran Clean Mesh, we see that Clean Mesh also displays a notification giving us information about the operation that it just performed. Boss Cutter also has notifications. If we click on the Hard Ops icon and we go to the Opt-ins area, there's an option for Boss Cutter notifications that can be toggled. And from there, when you begin drawing with Box Cutter, you'll begin seeing notifications showing up for Box Cutter operations. One of our extensions from Box Cutter over to Hard Ops, there's also a toggle for extra Box Cutter notifications, whereby toggling it off, the notifications will draw similar to previous, where basically the notifications are very basic and very simple, but it's definitely recommended for all users, especially those who are beginners, to basically draw with extended notifications so you can see information about their type of cut, their orientation, and also their Boolean operation at hand. If hard ops is present, pressing control K will display preferences similar to as I'm showing, where we can basically toggle between the preferences of hard ops and boss cutter at the same time and configure them as needed when it comes to adjusting them via their preferences. Clicking off will simply remove that preferences window, but if you're using hard ops, pressing control K will actually show the preferences windows on the fly, which actually shows the boss cutter preferences able to be toggled between and you're able to jump in and customize both hard ops and box cutter just basically on the fly. Also, if box cutter and hard ops are both installed at the same time, knife will have an option for hops mark, which means that the option specified in control tilde for your marking that's typically used whenever you run sharpen, which will sh mark sharp edges, will also take place for knife. So basically we'll draw a 3D box and if we tab in edit mode, we see that our box has been marked on all boundaries because of the mark options. Another thing I want to demonstrate is if we take all of these cubes and we use hard ops to basically press alt M and we control click blank material to give them all a blank material. One of the benefits of having both hard ops and box cutter installed is the ability to perform material cuts. So during our cut, we can press M in order to cycle through the various materials. We could also go back into the helper to remove the material as well as specify what material we would like to cut with. So now every cut that we do will take place using that particular material. However, that one's actually the same material as before, but now you can see material cut in action. In general, when box cutter is first enabled, there are a few behaviors I feel users must take into account to get the most out of their experience. If we expand the behavior sprocket, we can see that apply scale is enabled. This means that at the time that you draw your cut, scale will be applied. So let's take our cube scale it. We see that scale is one and one on X and Y, but not on Z. If we begin drawing, we see that 
this cut has now made the shape apply scale, allowing us to get in and add a bevel and there won't be any difficulty with scale related issues. The next one I want to talk about is auto smooth. Auto smooth will smooth the shape prior to you drawing your cut, allowing all your cuts to appear smooth. For example, if we draw a cut and we press B to bevel, we see that the bevel looks smooth in its transition. Rather than us going under the behavior panel and turning off auto smooth and then drawing a bevel and actually having it come out looking faceted. So auto smooth is on by default. The next one is parent shape. Parent shape ensures that your cutters move with your shape whenever you move them. So you see how I'm able to press G and move this shape and the shapes are coming along for the ride. The last one I want to talk about is AccuCut. AccuCut is a system for determining the depth of your cutter whenever you don't give it any depth and you intend to cut through. So right here I'm drawing a 2D shape and I'm pressing spacebar to cut through. And it will draw another shape and press spacebar to cut all the way through. If I were to press Q and use Everscroll, we see that this cutter is built to fit the size of the shape. And if we roll the wheel back to look at this other cutter, we see that this one is also sized to fit the size of the shape very nicely. When working in box cutter, you can draw a shape, but you could also press tab, which will pause it and give you this mode with dots. There's a dot for you to be able to adjust the extrude. There's a dot for you to adjust the offset. There's also a dot for you to affect the very draw, but you can also get in and affect the bevel by dragging bevel dot. In addition to this, you can also toggle the dots off and on by pressing Alt D. In the event that you don't want dots period, by going under behavior and under display, there's a toggle for display dots. However, I recommend by default having display dots on so that way you can tell when you're in a tab state. For example, right now we can't tell if we're in an extrude state or a pause state, but once we press tab and we see the dots, we definitely know that we're now free to zoom out and move around and do the various things that we need to do during this operation. So at the moment of apply, if shift is held, you will basically be able to shift a shape to live, just like you see me do here. If we were to delete this shape and start over, we could draw a shape, press B to bevel, and then from here, before the apply process, we could hold shift in order to keep it live and go in edit mode and select these various edges and press Q, unmark them, basically isolating the bevel to just this one edge. So sometimes shift to live can come in handy for a variety of situations, but one of the most basic ones is to simply go and use Ngon and bevel it and find yourself needing to adjust the points in a fine manner in order to get a different type of bevel. So here I am just drawing an Ngon. We'll grab that last point. We'll press B in order to bevel. And after we get it to a certain amount, we can extrude it forward. And let's just hold shift while clicking to keep the shape live. And I'm going to just select various edges and using hard ops bevel weight, under mark, I can just hold alt and click mark in order to lower the bevel weight of the selection for this particular area. And what this means is that now I'm able to increase the bevel for some of these other areas. So this is something that can be used sparingly, but does require a little bit of finesse in order to get it to work right because all the bevels are playing off at the same level. If we don't have a certain amount of lenience around, we can't get to some of these larger widths. So for example, because all the with all the weight has been lowered on some of the closer segments, we're able to roll up to a larger segment count and a larger distance for some of these larger bevels. So sometimes shift alive can come in very handy for times where you want to just take the shape into its own and make modifications to it. For example, I'm now cutting on the cutter itself, which basically gives me a rather interesting result. When it comes to box cutter, holding alt and scrolling is the fastest way to cycle through all the different cutter types available inside of box cutter. However, if you prefer to have alt scroll actually change your frame, underneath your input settings, you can actually toggle alt scroll change shape, which will basically make alt scroll change the timeline. However, we don't actually use that very much when it comes to box cutter. So by toggling on alt scroll change shape, we see we're able to scroll through the shapes very quickly and see most of the shapes that box cutter has to offer. Generally, when you're using box cutter, you're used to just drawing with classic box. However, it does have a variant of line box where there's also a toggle for it in the top bar. Basically line box will allow you to draw a line and then it will turn it into a box. So sometimes you wanna just draw a line at an angle, turn it into a box in order to complete your operation. Alternative to this, Box also has the variant of Grid. So if we go under the Shape Settings and we activate Grid, now whenever we draw a box, it's actually a grid cut. So if we look at it, we see that we've actually cut a grid all the way through. This is one of the shapes that's unincluded from Alt Scroll due to its lack of popularity. But we do see that whenever Grid is active, you are able to toggle Solidify, Auto Solidify, 
as well as the amount of divisions happening for both the x and y axis. So now that we talked about box, let's talk about circle and its variants. If we click on type, we see that polygon is number one, meaning it's the default. Modifier is number two, basically a screw modifier based circle, and it was the classic version of circle, which we're no longer using. And then there's star, which is a complete variant of circle, allowing for interesting combinations. But the one that we'll focus on first will be polygon. So with polygon, we already have our segment count set to 32. We could also manually click to type in our segments, but I like to use the presets in order to quickly set it to the value I want. One of the benefits of the polygon circle is that if we were to draw a circle, bring it in, press B in order to bevel, and press tab to pause, we could go under the helper and there's an icon under bevel for flipping it, which will basically give us basically a reverse bevel. So that's one of the benefits of having the new polygon circle. Modifier is just like the circle that I just showed, except that it has no capabilities when it comes to reverse bevel. So if we draw a shape in and we press B to bevel and tap to pause, we can go in here and choose to flip it and we see that it doesn't actually flip it like you would expect with the reverse bevel situation. The final one to talk about is star. Star is unique. Um, whenever you jump to star, you definitely want to jump it down to a lower segment count in order to get a nice result like a star or else you will get a very unusual result with something like 64 segments. However, I do find myself having fun with this as well by just pressing B in order to bevel to turn it into a gear and then adjusting the amount of width in between. And with this shape, you can also do something like press Shift T in order to taper in order to get a really unique shape altogether. So we'll press B again in order to adjust our bevel to at least not be overshooting our shape. And this is basically the result that we were able to get just playing around with star for just a moment. Now that we've talked about circle and its variants all the way down to star, let us talk about ingon. Typically with ingon, you'll be drawing a closed shape where the beginning and the end will be connected by a line. By double clicking on the last point, you can jump into the extrusion process. However, during the ingon process, you could also press C in order to change into a line formation in the event that you're wanting to draw as a line instead of a closed ingon. This is a toggle on the top bar where basically you can toggle between ingon and ingon as a line. But ingon line definitely has its uses whenever it comes to cutting panular shapes compared to classic ingon which is just used for just getting those classic verbose shapes. However, there are variants to ingon as well besides line. So if we go under the, the options for ingon, we see that there's a toggle for lasso. When lasso is toggled, you can actually draw freehand strokes and perform cuts using a more gestural approach compared to drawing ingon points. But in addition to lasso being a variant of ingon, you also have the ability to draw lasso as a line similar to ingon. So here we are just drawing a freehand lasso line. And then when we release the mouse, we're able to perform the extrusion process. So this is also something available as well. Whenever it comes to lasso, there are parameters for adjusting the amount of spacing in between points, as well as a toggle for adaptive calculation for us to calculate the lasso points based on your zoom level. Last but not least is custom. Custom utilizes a custom cutter as the cutter, and its only variant is line. So typically whenever you draw class Whenever you draw custom, it will utilize the same type of drawing behavior as box. Keep in mind that we are currently drawing from corner, but if you want to draw from the center, you could also do that with the press of the period key on your keyboard. So just like that, we're able to draw from center draw. We could press period again to jump to corner draw where we can draw freely or draw it equidistant from the center by basically pressing period. So in addition to being able to draw in the same behavior as box. There's a toggle for you to draw in the form of line, allowing you to basically draw a line to formalize your orientation first, and then from there draw after shape. Of course, you can hold shift in order to draw the shape one-to-one, -one, and you can even hold control during the extrude to extrude it to a certain depth that's actually appropriate for that particular cutter. If you draw a shape and apply it without giving it depth, you will activate something called laser cut, which is a calculation system for us attempting to cut all the way through the mesh. Whenever you draw and you attempt to extrude all the way through, you'll notice that the cut will limit at the end. This is triggering something called 
AccuCut, where we attempt to force the cut to be the same size as the mesh to prevent overshooting. We could also press Alt in order to turn off AccuCut and simply exceed the bounds of the shape. And if we want to draw a shape bigger than the shape that we're actually cutting, but typically whenever you're drawing and you apply, AccuCut will trim the shape and laser cut will cut all the way through the shape. So just letting you know that if you draw a shape and you give it no depth and you left click to apply, it will simply just cut through the shape. When working in box cutter, you're typically drawing from the corner. However, you can press period, not the numpad period, in order to change your draw type to go from corner to center, and then we'll just perform that extrusion. However, if we press D and we switch over to circle, we see that circle actually defaults from center draw, and pressing period will actually change us over to a freer draw where we're able to draw ovals, which is something I've tried to avoid with box cutter. However, even drawing in this corner view, we can hold shift in order to keep things one-to-one, -one, and then from there, perform our extrusion, drawing a perfect circle. Whenever it comes to Ngon, there are no draw modifiers, which is why you see these two grayed out. However, custom also plays by the same rules. So whenever you're using custom, typically custom actually starts from the corner draw, but in the event that you want to draw it from center, we can press period in order to change that draw type to be defaulting from center as far as draw modifiers go. However, we can also go in and change it back to corner if needed, and we can just draw a traditional custom cutter logo without having to go in and actually change the settings intimately. So if we look at the top, we see that we have snapping on and we're set to dots, meaning that when we hold control and we hover over the mesh, we will see snapping dots appear. So I'm going to jump off of this dot, and since we're in dynamic dots, we see that we drew an equidistant type shape. However, if we press Alt, we see that we're able to also draw from the corner just like we would normally expect. However, if we hold Alt, we can jump over to center. And so this is another way that you can approach draw modifiers on the fly, is actually using the hotkeys of shift to draw an equidistant shape, and then also the ability to hold control in order to draw basically a snap shape, where basically you are able to snap the shape to a certain increment amount if you have increment snap enabled. So if we go under our snap options and we turn on increment snap, this means that now whenever I hold control during the extrusion process, we're now able to perform the draw modifier of snap during this draw operation. So just let you know that there are a variety of methods. You can hold alt just in case you want to flip it just on the fly, just in case you don't always have to press period, but just letting you know that shift alt and control also have their purposes inside of box cutter when it comes to draw modification. In addition to the draw modifiers we discussed on Control, Shift, and Alt previously, we also have origin modifiers. So at the top, there are options for you to specify your origin to either be at the initial mouse position, the center of the initial face before extrusion, the bounding box, which means it calculates the extrusion as part of the equation as well, and then the target object, which will scale it at the origin area of the target object that you're actually drawing the shape on. So to show these in action, if we were to just draw a shape, if we press S, you see that we're actually scaling to the center of this top face, so that way the shape doesn't actually ever penetrate into the surface whenever we're scaling, which is just an interesting thing to do. Sometimes you want to be working and you want to be able to scale without having the object actually penetrate underneath the surface. The next one is mouse position. If we jump over to this one, we see that whenever we press S, it actually scales it at the first point that was drawn whenever we began clicking. The next one we'll talk about is bounding box, which this one will actually calculate the bounding box center of the shape itself. So that means whenever we scale it, it actually is capable of sinking below the surface. But then last but not least is target object. By clicking this one, whenever we scale, we're actually scaling into the center origin of the target object that we were initially drawing with. So these last two are very rarely used. However, they do exist in the event that they are needed. But the two that I typically fall between is mouse origin, but my favorite is always going to be the initial centered, just since I'm able to scale the shape and keep it inside of a central area while I'm sending it around the surface and not have it actually penetrate or go beneath, which can sometimes cause a little bit of an issue. During general box cutter use, in the event that you press L, you'll notice that the shading on the shape changes, which means that whenever you click to apply, that shape will be kept live. So now every shape that we draw will now be kept live on screen. In the event that you wish to turn this off, you can just press L and we see the shading goes back to normal. And then on the next draw, all the shapes disappear again. For this example, we'll go under the shape panel and we'll change over to circle where we already set to polygon and we have 32 segments. 
We'll also click on grid, which will activate both snapping and grid, meaning that whenever we hold control and we roll over to mesh, we now have a grid displayed. I'm just gonna click and drag on this first point to create a circle and we can press B to bevel, tab to pause, and then D to bring up our helper. From here, I'm just gonna click on flipping shape and we can just click to apply the shape and we're now done with the operation. So with our grid active, we could just control double click and just continue repeating the shape along in the formation of our grid as many times as we'd like. I just want to show that reverse bevel is also capable of being repeated. In addition to repeating on double click, there's also an option under the behavior sprocket under input for repeat click, which will basically delegate repeat to be a single click operation. So sometimes you wanna perform a repeat even faster. This is how you can do it, just by going in and toggling repeat click to be a single click operation. However, for the purposes of workflow continuity, I definitely recommend keeping it off because repeat can get in the way of certain operations if you're unaware of its presence. To demonstrate this example, let's draw a shape. We'll shift it to live, tap into edit mode, grab one of these edges and bevel it. Then from here, we're gonna select the target. We'll draw another shape, but this time I'm gonna hold shift. And then after extrusion, we're just gonna hold shift to shift it to live. I'm gonna tap in edit mode and we're just going to add a loop cut down the middle and just grab these two sides and remove them, turning that into a triangle. Next, we'll draw another shape, but this time we'll shift it to live again, place the loop cut in the middle, grab this piece, extrude it out, grab these two pieces, extrude them out, giving us a much different piece. In fact, let's grab this one and also extrude it down, resulting in a rather unique piece. We'll draw a fourth piece, shift it to live, and from here, we'll just perform a combination of the previous techniques where we add a loop there, we grab one of these sides after adding a loop in order to extrude it out as well, just giving us this particular shape. So basically, whenever you're drawing a shape, you can hold Alt and you can scroll to recall any of your previous shapes. And of course, keep in mind, if you want the same proportions as those shapes, you can press Tab, which will give you dots. And during the positioning of the draw dot, you can hold Shift in order to get a one-to-one -one recreation of the shape that you're recalling. So if we hold Alt and we scroll again, we can recall our previous triangle where I can just basically drag the dot while holding Shift in order to get it back to an equidistant amount. And then we can click to apply. So basically we recall the cutter that was used here and cut here. So let's just draw another shape. From here, I'm just gonna hold Alt and scroll. We don't even have to pause in order to Alt scroll, but I just prefer to pause whenever I'm Alt scrolling. And let's just call in this other shape where I can then drag the extrude dot and hold control in order to snap that. And we can even drag this dot, the draw dot, and hold shift in order to snap it to something equidistant. So just like that, we're able to recall shapes on the fly based on our previous cuts that we performed and modified. So here I have a shape paused. If I were to press R and rotate this shape, we see that it's rotating at about 15 degree increments with every mouse move. If we press D, we can actually look at our rotation slider and we can actually change this to something else. For example, now after clicking 90, whenever we press R, we see that we're able to rotate this on 90, which can result in a very sharp transition for us rotating it. But also keep in mind that holding shift will allow you to rotate things finally, basically overriding the snap settings in the event that you wanna get something very precise for your shape. But you could always just press D and change your snap settings to whatever they need to be for whatever results you're trying to get. So in the event that you need to just override it, keep in mind that during R you can just hold shift and get a fine override to get it exactly where you need your shape to be. Whenever you're drawing shapes with box cutters, sometimes the shading of the shape itself can get in the way of what you're trying to do. Pressing H will actually toggle the shape shading between a solid and wire display, just on the fly in the event that you actually need to see more of the mesh that you're affecting. In addition to being able to toggle your shading on the fly using H, there are additional shading options that are available to you during the usage of box cutter. For example, pressing Z will show the wireframe of the mesh just during draw, which is normally delegated just for knife. Shift Z will toggle the wireframe mode, similar to clicking this icon at the top. And then Alt Z will toggle see-through, which is the same as toggling this option at the top. So sometimes during the process of working, you may want to press Alt Z in order to see through the shape just to see what's going on, or press Z in order to see wireframe, or even Shift Z to jump to wireframe solid view. Typically, whenever you're using box cutter and you draw a shape, we will do our best to attempt to follow the shape with the mouse cursor. 
and this is our primary method of extrusion. However, if you were looking at a shape, say from the front, and you drew the shape and you wanted to perform an extrusion and actually give it depth, we see that the extrude amount is still at four because we don't actually have the ability to read it on the depth level until we actually rotate the shape. And this was traditionally the way that box cutters extrusion was always done. However, the time came for us to attempt something different. So underneath the input, the very final option is something called alternative extrude. And what this does is it allows users to draw a shape and perform an extrusion based off of a gesture rather than actually ray casting to the mouse. So in the event that you want to perform an extrusion to depth, but based off of a locked view, you're able to do that. So just like that, even looking at the front, I was able to cut almost through this shape. And the same goes for general types of extrusions as well, not even frontally oriented ones. So we could draw this shape and we see that the mouse distance that I'm moving is actually affecting the cut rather than where I'm actually moving the mouse. So this is a alternative way to extrude, but it is my preferred method of working now because it does allow us to basically draw a shape from the side and then move our mouse to see exactly how deep we want it to cut. So it's one of those things that exists for users who may require it. However, I personally am a big fan of alternative extrude. And just keep in mind that if you want to turn alternative extrude off and on, you could press alt. So here I am using alternative extrude where things can get a little bit weird because I'm trying to use it like the former system where I'm like ray casting to my mouse. But to do that, I would need to press alt and now we can actually get that former system of extrusion back. Alt is also connected to the releaser of AccuCut. So we see that we're also able to cut exceeding the form whenever we press alt. And then if we tap alt, we see that we're back to alternative extrude and also to the limits of the shape itself. Generally, when you're working in box cutter, you're also working in the fast solver system. In fact, as I draw this cut, you can see my notification saying that I'm using fast. If we bring our shape in and we press tab, we can see when we zoom in that the shape is slightly offset from the surface. And it's our goal to make sure that every cut connects. And to do that, a little bit of offset is needed. However, sometimes when working with very small scale or in very particular situations, offset isn't actually needed. So I'm gonna press Control K to bring up my preferences. And the first thing I'm gonna do is turn off auto save preferences because I don't wanna save any changes I do to my preferences, but underneath the behavior, or actually under the shape, we can adjust the offset. So I'm gonna take the offset and change it all the way to zero. And now whenever we click and drag, we see that Z fighting is happening on the surface because the shape is sitting exactly on the surface. But we also see that our cut didn't go through successfully in fast because we're so closely oriented to the surface. If we were to press Alt E, in order to change this to exact, we see that this cut was able to go through successfully and we were able to cut all the way through and we were able to cut flatly starting on this face. So sometimes when working in exact, you may want to have your offset be off in order to get very precise situations. But just a reminder that Z fighting is a thing and you may have problems later on whenever it comes to working in fast if you decide to turn off your offset. So even with exact on, we can see that it's definitely no savior just yet whenever it comes to making sure every cut works out. So definitely work with care whenever it comes to turning your offset off. In fact, I'll press control K and we're just gonna type in 0 0.005 to set it back where it was and we see that now we're able to cut through the surface just like you would normally expect. So sometimes turning off surface offset can be a little problematic, but we're definitely taking some steps to try to facilitate the process. So another example I wanna talk about is if we press Control K and we look at our offset, we see that our offset is set back to 0 0.005, which is the default. But if we were to simply draw a shape and extrude it down, and we press J to turn it into a join, we see that it does not work out. But if we were to press D and we go in our helper and change our solver over to exact, we see that it does work out. But using hard ops, I'm gonna press Alt V just to turn on wireframe and we can see that the wireframe isn't so perfect for this particular exact union operation. If we were to press Q and go under hard ops and just put a decimate modifier, we see that we were able to create this piece perfectly flush with the surface, allowing us to perform a decimate to basically clean the surface up. Just wanted to show that any event that you're using exact and join, we will take special care to try to reduce the offset on the surface to allow it to union a little bit better as shown. However, before moving on, let's try it with a slightly trickier example. I'm gonna draw a box, we'll press B to bevel, roll the wheel for segments, press J to turn it into join, and we're just gonna extrude it all the way through and just click to apply. 
So we've done the same maneuver as before, except this time we have a bevel added to the mix. If we were to take our decimate and drag it down the stack, we see that we weren't able to actually get it to perfectly offset, and that's because of the order that we completed the operations in. So to show it again, we're gonna begin drawing in red, and we'll perform our extrusion ending in red because it terminates at the end of the shape. And if we press B to bevel, we can add our bevel, and if we press J, we've now turned it into a join. So if we click to apply, now we've actually completed the operation the same way that we did this one. So without even adjusting the offset, I can take the decimate, move it down the stack, and we see that this area was also cleaned up. So it's a particular type of workflow that's used where sometimes you'll draw a shape, let Accu shape limit it to the amount that it should be extruded. We could press B to bevel, press J to turn it into a join, click to apply. Of course, we're looking at a slight geometric disaster, but we move decimate down the list. It's perfectly clean. So you don't always have to lower the offset in order to get this sort of thing going. We do have special behaviors we're working on in place to allow users to kind of get that result that they're get getting on the fly without having to actually adjust those settings. When it comes to box cutter, multiple alignments exist. So to show this in action, I'm gonna press X and delete this cube and we're gonna shift A at a plane. And for this plane, I'm just gonna press Control X to delete one of these edges. And we're just gonna drag this up so that we definitely have one of our longest edges here. And then one edge that's almost as long. And from here, we can begin talking about orientation. So if I begin drawing a box, it's gonna to orient to the local orientation of the shape. That means if I rotate the shape and the rotation's unapplied, I'm still going to locally be oriented to the shape whenever I try to cut through it. However, if we press shift V, we can bring up the basically the orientation helper and we can jump from local to longest edge. This now means that whenever we draw a cut, it will be oriented to the longest edge of the shape. So in this case, the longest edge is this area, but because we cut this edge, this edge is no longer the longest edge. So that means that whenever I draw this cut, it's now actually oriented to this edge, which is now the longest edge. Let's bring it up here. So that way this edge doesn't lose its ability to be the longest. So if we begin drawing in this area, we see that we're still oriented to this edge because it is the longest edge. Of course, we may have to bring the dot down a little bit to extrude all the way through. 2D cuts can be a little strange, but just like that, that's basically how longest edge works. If we press Shift V, we could change from longest edge to nearest edge. And what this means is that the edge nearest to us will be what we orient to. So as I draw close to this edge on the side, we see that we're oriented now to this edge. But if I begin drawing in this area, we see that we're now oriented to the nearest edge on that side. So it's just a way that you can get the most out of box cutter whenever it comes to orientation. Sometimes you actually want to orient to a nearby area in order to have all your shapes be congruent as you see me doing here. But it can also get a little bit weird at times. So we see I'm trying to draw a shape around this oriented in the same way, but it's not working out. Let's press Alt V and turn on wireframe. If we look at the wireframe, we see that our nearest edge is actually tragically located in this area, which is gonna cause us some problems. This means I'll need to draw starting from a little bit lower, and then we can press G, move it up, and we can even move our draw dot, form an extrusion, press T, and here we are basically cutting out this area, just utilizing the orientation of a, another nearest edge in order to get us oriented correctly for this particular area. So some of these things can be a little bit tricky, but it's definitely recommended that new users spend a little bit of time just playing around with orientation to get acquainted with it. So that way they can get the most out of it and be able to get their shapes oriented exactly to the locations that they want to without issue. So for this area, we see that the first catch didn't work. The second catch that I did a little bit further down was able to reach the edge that's nearest to it, allowing me to make this cut angled exactly along the previous shapes that were being drawn. Previously, we talked about how if you begin drawing on the surface, you'll begin orienting to that surface. But if you begin drawing off of the surface, you'll basically orient yourself to view. So that's something important to keep in mind whenever it comes to using box cutter, in addition to actually selecting the mesh that you wanna draw on or else you're gonna make a make box. But in the event that you wanna draw over the surface but orient yourself to view, there's a toggle in the top bar where you can toggle yourself to draw oriented to view. 
and now every shape that's being drawn is actually being oriented to the view that I'm currently looking at the shape from. Pressing Shift V, we can also see that inside of the mini helper for orientation, there's an option for auto ortho, where in the event that you're drawing an orthographic and you begin drawing in view, we'll orient you to orthographic to ensure that your cut goes through the way that you more than likely intended. However, by toggling this off, we can just work in perspective and we see that our cuts drawn from view are just a little bit stranger. So definitely keep in mind that orthographic gives the most predictable results when it comes to cutting from view, but we also support drawing in perspective as well, in addition to automatically orienting the user to orthographic whenever they're drawing from view. So we talked about orientation in object mode. If we tab into edit mode, I'm gonna select this point and this point, and we'll press J to put an edge in between them. And by pressing Alt W to start box cutter, we can press two and just select this edge. Basically under orientation settings, there's an option for use active edge. And this means that whenever you're in edit mode, you can actually orient your cuts to an active edge that you have selected, which can come in handy for those times when you wanna just override your orientation in edit mode based on your current edge selection. So during draw, you have the hotkey of Alt E to toggle between the various types of solvers inside of Blender that are utilized by Box Cutter just under the hotkey of Alt E. It even says that in the notification display. So right now we're working under exact. Exact can be fun. However, there does come a time whenever you have it in your workflow that you'll notice that it begins hitting you a little bit hard as far as performance goes. So right now I'm just performing a series of cuts under exact and eventually we'll start to see the speed catch up as the boxes lose a little bit more and more of their FPS with every operation. And this is just one of the big differences between fast and exact and one of the reasons that we decided to add it to the notification to increase user awareness. So whenever you're working, just keep that in mind that exact can definitely have its benefits for helping you solve some co-planner situations, but can also have some unneeded implications whenever it comes to speed as you continue working with it. In fact, as I've gotten further in these cuts, I'm now at 15 modifiers according to my helper notification and we see that the cuts are now performing even slower than before. However, the interesting thing is that if we were to go under the hard ops icon for bevel, we can actually look at the booleans and we see that everything is set up for exact. If we click the fast button, they're all set to fast. Now the next cut that we performs, even though it's under exact, it performs a lot faster because all the subsequent mods underneath are a lot more fluid. There I pressed Alt E to change back over to fast and we see that we're able to work a lot more fluidly underneath fast than we were under exact. Of course, this is something that I believe is only gonna be temporary for exact. It'll only be getting faster from here on out, maybe even be faster by the time that you guys are watching this video, but just letting you know that there are some definite speed differences and performance hits that come between fast and exact, but we do add the ability to press D and toggle that on the fly. You could also do it in the helper, but most importantly, the Alt-E hotkey will allow you to change your solver on the fly. Whenever it comes to box cutter, the dots have a double purpose. So if we draw a shape and we bring it down under the extrusion and we press tap to pause it, this is our bevel dot, this is our offset dot, this is our extrude dot, and this is our draw dot. However, if we were to shift drag the offset dot, we see that we're able to freely move the shape around. If we shift drag the extrusion dot, we see that we're able to perform a taper on the shape. And additionally, if we shift drag on the bevel dot, we see that we're able to perform a solidification. So just letting you know that there are some additional duties that are assigned to dots that we'll more than likely be expanding on in the future. But typically in box cutter operation, you use these dots to deal with the offset of your shape, the extrusion, and the bevel amount on the fly, jumping between a bevel and a chamfer, and also adjusting your draw. So generally in box cutter, when you enable snapping, you're generally inside of a system called dots. Dots has a very different type of perspective to it. However, it's our vanilla snapping method whenever it comes to box cutter. So if we hold control, we have our dot showing. And if I begin clicking and dragging from this edge, we see that we activate it basically center equidistant draw for drawing from this edge and we're able to perform our extrusion. However, when it comes to a face, if we were to just click and drag from this face, we see that we're drawing absolute center draw, basically allowing us to cut through this shape very evenly. So whenever it comes to our dot system, we have attempted to streamline our behaviors to be a little bit faster based on thousands of hours of box cutting done in the past. So whenever it comes to dots, 
just know that you can actually expect some things. For example, the ability to just draw straight out from both sides whenever you're using an edge dot and the ability to draw it using center draw whenever you're using a face. However, there's an alternative system of dots that is less talked about but is a little bit more expanded in a different direction. So with dots out the way in a cursory way, we can expand on snap and we see that there's a static area where we can enable basically static dots and we see that once enabled static dots will take over in the top bar and from here we can begin talking about some of the features of static. So one of the things to note with static is that while you have dots up, if you were to press Q, you can actually remove dots, which is somewhat strange, but definitely something that I've become more into as I've become aware of it. Of course, keep in mind that we can hold uh, control in order to keep that state or release it and then press it again in order to bring our dots back. Another thing about static dots that's interesting is while holding control and shift, you're able to roll the wheel in order to perform a subdivision of dots. And so from here, if we click and drag, we're able to basically jump off these dots, but you see that the dots disappear the moment we begin drawing. If we expand the drop down, we see that there's an option for dot to dot snap, which means that when we click and drag from one dot, the dots don't disappear. It actually lets us go from dot to dot, just creating shapes. So just a more interesting way to work. Not something I use in my general box cutter experience, but definitely something that's very nice to have. If we press D, we can jump over to Ngon and we see that Ngon is also able to play connect the dots where we're able to just draw Ngon from dot to dot progressing along this shape until we finally get back to the dot we need and then click to extrude and complete. The next thing I want to talk about is alignment preview. So if we press escape, we can clear dots off the screen after they've been locked. And alignment preview will basically show an alignment preview of what your shape is going to draw as. So we see that when we look at alignment preview at this time, everything is fairly boring except for these two. And that's because if we press shift V, we're actually oriented to nearest edge. So that means if we were to say, select these two points and put an edge in between them, our alignment dot will actually reflect us being able to draw oriented to this particular area. And maybe not so much with Ngon, but definitely with Box, we're able to orient it to these edges and it gives us a nice little preview of what we're about to be drawing in a way oriented to. The next one I want to talk about is subdivision preview. With subdivision preview, whenever you hold control and shift and begin scrolling, you see that there's some subdivision lines appearing in between, just letting us know which ones are faces, which ones are edges, and which ones are verts. Over the course of testing out dot subdivision, it became apparent that maybe it would be good to be able to see these edges in between just to assist on a uh, debug sense when it comes to dealing with certain dots and the results that we get with them. But just letting you know that static dots is a slightly different method, kind of expanding in a different path than our general dots, which I feel are more behaviorally refined for us to be able to rapidly get from A to Z in a general workflow. But static dots offers a specialty behaviors for times where we need dots to behave in a way that's a little bit more static and a little bit more predictable, or we simply just need to use dot to dot to get somewhere in between, but also keeping things fairly congruent with the other shapes around. Alternative to the dot snapping system that we discussed previously, we also have grid. Whenever you activate grid, you're using something called the dynamic grid, which is basically a grid that's aimed to show up only at the cursor and be as unobtrusive as possible, aiming to do the basic purposes of grid and really nothing more. However, for users requiring something a little bit more contemporary, we do also offer the option for a static grid. So once we toggle that, we see that our grid is overridden with static and we have a plethora of static settings we're able to deal with. So static grid is a little bit more different because it actually has borders. But one of my favorite things about static grid is you can right click and actually get it to stay in place. Another thing about static grid is you can hold control shift and right click in order to dynamically adjust your grid. We can hold shift and scroll in order to add subdivisions on this grid on the fly. We can press escape to cancel it. We could also have this grid be the same color as the mode that's at hand. So right now we're in cut, so our grid is red. If we were to press D, change over to slice, we see that our grid is now yellow. We can jump over to blue, see the grid as a knife grid for a blue box. But just like that, we can jump back over to red, which is my default state that I normally am working from. So by turning that off, we can have the grid just be vanilla and generic for every state without it having any sort of color inheritance. The next thing I want to talk about is grid overlay, which by toggling this off, it will make the blender grid disappear whenever you're working in an orthographic view. So here I am looking at it from the side. 
When I hold control, we can see that all the blender grids disappeared, just leaving me with my own grid. I can press escape to cancel. It br brings back the blender grids. Same thing for all the other views. We see that the grids just disappear whenever that setting is on. Always in front basically means that the grid will always be in front no matter what. So here we have the grid actually being tracked to this inside face, but we see the grid actually showing through the mesh as if always in front was on. So if we go in and we toggle this and remove it and bring up the grid again, we see that now the grid is actually placed behind the object, which gives me a better idea of where the grid's placed. But sometimes you actually want to see the grid no matter what all the time. So that's where always in front comes in. The next thing I want to talk about is auto transparency. This one is on by default. And what this means is that whenever you have your grid out, let's draw it normally. Right now I'm still orienting it to a local edge. If we press Alt V and we look at our wireframe, we see that this is the edge that more than likely the grid is trying to orient itself to. So if we freeze it and lock it down just like so, and we begin drawing, we see that the grid actually goes semi-transparent here in draw. And if I right click and cancel, we see that the grid is back at full illumination. So just like that, there's a lot of versatility whenever it comes to static grid for you being able to reduce this transparency while you're working. Always show it in front in the event that you don't want it obscured by objects in your way. By having the blender grids disappear and even having the grid colored the same way as the mode that's at hand. So. The mode color isn't so much used with static grid because really I'm just getting in here to just use the static grid. I don't need to really know the mode because I'm already aware of it. But just in case, you can always just toggle these behaviors off and on to really get the most out of static grid. And there's plenty of videos actually talking about static grid in depth on my channel. So in the event that you wanna find out more information, there's definitely a lot of reasons to give both of these grids a shot. As we discussed previously, whenever it comes to grid, you can just click on the grid icon to enable grid. And from there, just holding control will allow you to orient the grid to the surface that's under your mouse whenever you hold down the control key. However, in the event that you don't want to hold down the control key all the time, this lock icon will allow you to just basically tap control and it will just orient the grid to that surface and permanently lock it up, just allowing you to work without having to deal with the grid actually being in the way. And at this point, once you have the grid actually locked up on screen, you'll more than likely need to press escape in order to remove it. And if you want to turn this behavior off, just clicking the lock icon will jump you out of grid into dots, but just having the lock off will put you back in the behavior where basically holding control will keep the grid on screen. Whenever it comes to static, these behaviors are also the same. So if we click on the lock icon, we see that static is up on screen without me having to even press tab to lock it or to press spacebar to lock it, which is another way to freeze the static grid in the event you want it to stay up. So just by having a lock icon, you can have your grid up all the time. And then by pressing escape in static and then pressing it again, we see that we're able to research for the surface. Contrary to us using dynamic grid where we can lock the grid up on screen and then press control to rescan the surface, press control again to rescan the surface, just a variance between the two types of grids, but both of them definitely support the lock parameter. And just keep in mind that whenever you have this in place, your grid icon will be a little bit redder and just pressing escape will allow you to clear a grid off screen once you have it locked up there. So while previously we talked about how our main grid is the dynamic grid, there are some benefits to static that makes it rather unique. So I'm just going to take this cube, scale it down, and we're just going to add a loop cut in the middle, grab this edge, bring it up, grab this entire edge loop, just bevel it with control B. And from here we can press D, bring out a circle, and we're just going to cut a circle into the surface, but we'll press shift T in order to give it a little bit of depth to it. And if we press Alt V and we look at our wireframe, we see that our wireframe looks a little, little bad. So let's control A, visual geometry to mesh. And from here, let's just take a moment and sharpen it in order to protect all our boundaries. And we can actually just select just this top face because it's being isolated by a seam with L. And by pressing Shift H, we can hide it. And if I press Alt W and we change over to static grid, Static Grid has an additional behavior of being able to perform knife projection, which is really interesting. Another thing about Static Grid is while moving it, we can hold Shift in order to move it finely. So sometimes you want to do fine translation. That is possible inside of Grid. 
and I'm just shift scrolling to add some additional spans to it. And by pressing shift K, we can actually perform a knife project inside of static grid, allowing us to basically project geometry onto other surfaces. So sometimes I'll use this for some studies on topological replacement. And I do have quite a bit of fun using it inside of box cutter. We see that some of these surface, surfaces didn't actually knife very well. So let's undo this and let's try that again. More than likely I began on the surface when really I should have been oriented to view and we could press G, hold shift in order to move it in a fine increment, shift scroll to add a few sections and shift K and we see that this one came out perfect. So sometimes when you're working oriented to a surface, that's something that you wanna be aware of because it can affect your knife projection. So here I am just going in, dissolving a little bit of geometry to clean up this particular surface. If you don't mind, this is just a demonstration. I've done a couple of videos now on voxelization and what our plans are with it. But just like that, we've now given this a very nice quad based geometry base to start with. And then if you're using mesh machine, you could always just get your boundary selection and then press Y and use Boolean cleanup to really just mop this area up as far as cleanup goes, giving us a much nicer result on the shading. So whenever it comes to box cutter, our goal is to have the add-on be as responsive to the user as possible down to the refresh rate of your monitor. So if you press Control K, you can bring up the box cutter preferences. And underneath display, one of the first options listed is your shader update FPS, where we'll attempt to update it at the rate that you have specified. Normally we have it defaulted to 60, which feels very smooth. However, in my case, I'm gonna right click, bring up display settings in Windows in order to go to my advanced display settings. If we look at the graphic settings of my main monitor, we see that my refresh rate is 200 hertz. So that means that I have a little bit of room to grow and I could go in and set my refresh rate to something like 200, which more than likely won't make any difference in the video and the way that you're seeing it. But basically should assist box cutter with updating correctly and looking even better for my particular display. So just letting you know that depending on your refresh rate, you may also want to update box cutter to update the same way. So in general box cutter use, you'll find yourself clicking and dragging to create a shape and then releasing left mouse button to jump into extrude and then clicking to apply. Alternatively, you can just click and drag to create your shape, click and be done without specifying any depth whatsoever. In fact, the process of laser cutting is so fast that you can't really decipher what's going on in this process, except that it just cut all the way through the mesh and it's over. So we do have steps offered to allow users to break down that process. So if we click on release lock, we see that whenever you click and drag and create a shape, it actually drops you into a 2D state and shows you dots. So it basically auto pauses, allowing you to grab this dot and bring it down and then from there click and apply. So this is just an alternative way that you're able to use box cutter where you're able to basically click and drag to create your shape and then you're able to do stuff like shift drag this dot in order to move the shape around click and drag to perform the extrusion drag this dot to perform a bevel you know shift drag this dot to perform a solidify and then of course click to apply however repeat lock is a lot more than just the option that we're clicking if we shift click it we see that there's release lock release lock laser cut which will also check and repeat lock so Laser cut lock will basically allow us to cut through and perform a laser cut, but it will pause it and allow us to actually see what shape we're actually getting calculated before the operation completes. So we'll draw another shape. It drops us into a 2D state. If we click, we see that it actually shows us what the result of cutting through the mesh is gonna look like before and allows us this opportunity to get in and actually adjust the dots and do things with the shape that we normally wouldn't be able to do because laser cut is usually over and done with in a snap. So by clicking and applying, we're now done with that. And let's go and turn off actual release lock. So that way, whenever we click and drag, we're just working. But if we perform a laser cut, we see that we're still able to get the pause because underneath the settings, we still have release lock laser cut enabled. So it's just an interesting way to work. Sometimes you wanna work, but you wanna pause your shapes and actually look at what your shape results are gonna be. Like maybe I wanna actually stare at the shape and wonder why it's popping out so far, but you know, that's a story for another day. So 
We'll try that same cut again. We see this one actually laser cut properly. And so we can just click and apply this. So sometimes whenever we're doing diagnosis, it's important for us to be able to pause the shape and actually take a good look at it just to examine that the results that we're getting or what we're actually intending to go for. The last option I wanna talk about in here or the third option I want to talk about, not the last, is repeat lock. So we talked about how you could draw a shape and then by double clicking, you can actually repeat a shape. But what if you wanted to pause that shape as you're repeating it? So now that the shape is paused, I can actually rotate it, move it up to a different area and place it. I can control double click, place another shape, rotate this one back to the original shape, spacebar, apply it, control double click, got this shape, I'm just gonna rotate it, bring it over here. So repeat lock also has its own benefits for allowing users to be able to repeat and then pause and then get in and make fine adjustments to the repeat prior to the application process. The last one I wanna talk about is quick execute, which quick execute is like the antithesis of release lock, meaning that while re release lock aims to give you more flexibility with being able to get your operations done in a more stepped fashion, quick execute aims to be the quickest way to execute your operation. So we see that with these shapes, it's not even allow us, allowing us an option for depth. It's just cutting through the shape, entirely through the shape. Just every cut is just a kill shot. There's no need for me to double click. It's just a single click and drag and release and we're cutting all the way through the shape. Sometimes you'll find yourself in a workflow where you'll need to cut more rapidly than usual. And that's the reason that some of these workflows exist inside of Box Cutter. Um, most of the time, you'll be able to get away with the vanilla style of working. However, these options definitely exist for the power users to help them get the most out of their experience and maybe work at the speed that they're thinking or concepting or wanting to get these things done. But just like that, we're able to just draw cuts and they laser cut all the way through without us having to do any additional clicks. And that's the power of quick execute. So keep in mind that this one is probably the most dangerous of the settings that if you have it on, it's definitely going to give you a more jarring experience, especially if you're not aware of it. So we do have this one pushed back a little bit, but repeat, but release lock is fun for everyone. So you just get in, draw a shape, it just pauses it for you. You can then get in and perform your extrusion. It will automatically pause that for you. You can sit here, look at your shape, think about what you're performing and then click and apply. So located in the D helper, we can talk about auto depth and laser cut. So laser cut, we've already talked about. However, if we click on this icon, we've now jumped over into auto depth, which means that we can now draw shapes and the depth will be specified automatically by a system that we've generated inside of box cutter. So right now it's actually calculating the depth based on the longest edges that are being used. However, there are toggles for auto depth to use the opposite edge that it's using for the calculation that can result in a slightly different result. Another thing about auto depth is that there's a multiplier where you can basically specify what percentage of the depth you want to use. So now that it's 0.3, that means that I'm going to be drawing shallower cuts whenever I'm drawing. Let's change this to 0 0.03 and let's toggle this option off. And we see that now I'm cutting far shallower cuts, even though I'm drawing much larger shapes than before. And that's just the power of being able to get in and use the multiplier. So sometimes you want to be able to get in and do the behaviors that you saw with quick execute, but with even more control. And that is where these options come in. We'll change this back to 0.3 because it's getting just way too thin there. And now we're actually getting something a little more reasonable that we can work with. So the next one I want to talk about is custom proportion. So if we were to jump over to custom cutter, auto depth also works with custom cutter. So we'll change this back to one. And this means that whenever I draw a cutter, it's actually going to have auto depth attached to it. And the shape's going to come out proportionally accurate every single time. So this is something that we're currently working on expanding on internally. However, auto depth expands on quick execute and allows for far more control than you could have had dealing with the release lock system. So it's just another way to just control the depth of your shapes just on the fly whenever it comes to using box cutter. So by clicking this option for auto depth, we jump back over to laser cut, just basically turning auto depth back off and we're just drawing the shapes the same way we classically would where we start off drawing, we can hold control or shift in order to uh, get it proportional, hold control to get it one to one and then click to apply so that way we can get a one-to-one -one cut without having to shift to live. 
Previously, we talked about how whenever you click and drag, you begin drawing your shape. When you release the mouse, you begin the extrusion process. And then when you click, it completes it. If you click and drag without depth, you perform what's called a laser cut, where it will cut through the mesh. However, laser cut depth can be overridden with the depth parameter. So if we go in here, we type in something like 0.25, whenever we draw a shape and we give it depth, we see that it doesn't cut all the way through the mesh, allowing us to get a custom depth whenever it comes to us using laser cut. So sometimes this can come in handy for whenever you want a very particular depth. However, right here, we see that due to a hotline on the fast algorithm, we ran into an issue. So if I press Control Z to undo this, we could press D to go into helper and change our algorithm from fast to exact. And then when we perform this cut, we see that that one worked out, except we cut on the wrong area of plane of seeing. And really it's because the mesh is so flat. If we press Alt VE, we can give this some shading and actually see what we're doing. And now whenever I cut and drag, we see that we're able to cut and it's able to keep cutting to that same depth and even connect these varying depths to each other, which is just one of the benefits of using the exact system. But just like that, you can get in box cutter and just modify your depth to be whatever you need it to be for those times whenever you need a custom depth. Whenever it comes to applying, there's a lot of ways you can apply. There's a plethora of ways to do it inside of hard ops. You could press control A in Blender and just choose visual transform, which will apply all of your modifiers. However, box cutter also has an apply button in the top bar that will remove the cutters for you as well. So if we click on it, you can see that all the cutters disappeared that were associated with this object, as well as all the modifiers associated with it. So that's just one level of, of apply. The next level of apply is if we work in edit mode, we can draw a shape, we can shift to live, which will put us in the edit mode of the shape that we were drawing where we can get in and make fine edits. And we can just get in here and just keep making edits to the cutter we were dealing with. And then we can click the apply button and actually apply that operation we were doing and jump us back into edit mode, allowing us to continuously refine on this shape, even though we were just dealing with the object and then we jump to the cutter and then we jump back to the object to finish things. Apply can also be done on the cutter level. So if I press Control Z a couple of times just to undo to the point that I applied all of these modifiers, let's actually draw a modifier and let's shift it to live. And so now we have this modifier. If we click the apply button, we basically applied only that one cutter. And if we tap into edit mode, we can see that we applied actually that one cutter and that all the rest of our cutters are still live. So if we were to click and drag and create a box, first of all, I wanna make sure that I'm in fast and I also wanna make sure that I have zero on my laser cut depth so I can cut as deep as I want. So where was I? So I'm gonna click and drag to create a box and we're gonna press B in order to bevel. And if we press tab to basically drop this shape, we could press D and go inside the box helper in order to basically activate Q bevel which will give us a second bevel, which gives us an option to basically flip the bevel, giving us a reverse bevel. If we click and apply, that operation is done. So this was the first shape that received the reverse bevel. The next one was circle, which required that we make an entirely new type of circle called polygon. If you're in polygon or star, you are able to perform a reverse bevel, but not inside of modifier as shown previously. So by drawing a circle, we can do the same thing. We could just press B, press tab, click on the reverse button, and here we are basically drawing a reverse bevel on a circle. So the next thing is, of course, to add this to Incon, but just letting users know that reverse bevel is possible with both box and circle at this time. So if we use a little bit of hard ops and box cutter, let's just bring out a circle, and we'll bring it in, bevel it, press D, flip it so it's a reverse bevel, and then shift to live so we can have the shape on our selection. If we were to press Q and go under bevel, we have access to the shift P default profiles that are built into hard ops now, where basically by scrolling custom profiles on the circle, we can get some really interesting types of circles out of box cutter. So to try that again, we'll draw a circle on this side and we'll press B to bevel, shift F to flip. And this time we'll just shift it to live, which is a general way that I use box cutter. And then we could press shift P and just begin scrolling through these profiles until we find one that looks particularly nice. And then from here, we can just look at the results. So just letting users know that reverse bevel works wonders on circles whenever it comes to box cutter hard ops connections. Sort can be found in the control tilde workflow area of hard ops where it can be enabled and disabled at will. However, in box cutter under the behavior sprocket, 
if we go underneath behavior, we see the first option is sort modifiers. Hovering over each of these will explain how sort affects these modifiers relationship whenever it comes to us adding Boolean using box cutter. However, the area that I want to talk about is this expandable drop down at the end where we talk about sort depth. Traditionally, whenever you're working with box cutter, you're able to work and say add a mirror like I am using right now with hard ops pressing alt X we see that the mirror modifier is being kept at the end of the stack, meaning that every subsequent cut is being placed before the mirror in order to ensure that symmetry is being kept. However, you could always toggle off render visibility on a particular modifier, and that will simply bypass the sort rule, allowing you to basically unlock a symmetry whenever you're working, if you're needing to work without mirror being present. Keep in mind that you could always reactivate the mirror, and because we're only one, two, three modifiers away, that means on the next cut, the modifier stack will be corrected with the mirror being placed at the end. However, sometimes you actually wanna have a modifier placed in a particular area of the stack and you wanna work on a localized area of the stack. So for example, right now we have two modifiers and then we have our mirror. Let's say that we want to work only on the later part of the stack without affecting the mirror. Well, that's where sort depth comes in. Traditionally, we have it default at four, However, if we lower it to something like two, we see that with every cut, we're able to still work on the same side without moving the mirror modifier because that mirror modifier is actually more modifiers away than our sort depth is allowing. And this sort of behavior is also available in hops in the control tilde area where you can basically set up your sort depth to basically affect only the later part of your modifier. So sometimes if you're dealing with a very heavy modifier based workflow, this can come in handy and then even if we were to raise our depth back up to something like four, we can see that the mirror modifier still isn't moving because it's just very far away. In fact, at this point, we would need to raise our modifier depth to something like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, in order to grab this mirror. However, personally, I recommend instead of raising the depth that you would just grab the mirror and move it manually if you're trying to do such a thing. However, in this case, we're just demonstrating how sort can be overridden on the fly whenever it comes to using box cutter and hard ops. Whenever it comes to sort and bevel, with box cutter it has a series of interesting behaviors that shows that all bevels are not indeed created equal. So the first one we'll talk about is ignoring bevels that are using weights. So for this we'll press Q and we'll sharpen this box which will basically mark every sharp edge allowing us to add a bevel but then press L to change its limit method to weight. If we expand our modifier stack, we can see that any new cuts that are being placed are being placed after the weight since cutters don't have the ability to work very well whenever it comes to transferring weight to other meshes. The next one we'll talk about is vertex group. So we'll delete that object and we'll just add this plane and I'm just going to select a single point and press Q and we're just gonna control click mark in order to bevel just a single point in edit mode. And if we press Q and solidify in object mode and then press Q and sharpen, we have a nicely shaded object. And so basically whenever it comes to bevels with vertex groups, we also ignore them when it comes to sorting as far as moving them because it's very troublesome to actually have a vertex group modifier bevel being moved to the top of the stack because it just affects its ability to display. So here I'm performing an inset and we see that even though I was able to inset this, nothing happened to the modifier. If the modifier were to have been moved, we would have ended up with something like this or something like this, but definitely not the result that we were going after, which is this. So the next one we'll be talking about is ignoring bevels using only verts. So this refers to basically if we add a plane and we press Q and we bevel, because this is a 2D mesh, we're basically doing what's called a 2D bevel. So that means that underneath our bevel options, we're beveling only vertices. If we press Q and we solidify this, this is similar to the shape we were talking about with the V groups, except this time we're actually just dealing with an individual vertice on a whole with the modifier instead of just adding an individual vertex group. So of course, as you would expect, if I draw a box and I press I to turn it into an inset, we see that we're able to draw this shape and have it execute without us moving this bevel modifier, which would also be troublesome if it were getting moved to the end of the stack. So just want to show how we have a very intimate relationship whenever it comes to bevel, whenever it comes to sort. So by understanding this, you're able to get the most out of your box cutter experience. 
So this particular model that we're looking at has a UV map assigned, which indicates that this model has UVs. If we were to click and drag and create a shape, we see that basically everything inside of it has been just shaded the same color because there are no UVs attached to the cutter. In order to show this in action, we can ever scroll, bring back this cutter. If we were to just select it and press U and choose something like Smart Project or Smart Unwrap, here we go we now have UVs on the cutter being transferred to the mesh. So whenever it comes to box cutter, underneath the behavior panel, there's an option for cutter UV where when enabled, you can actually have your cutters get UVs assigned to them at the time that you begin drawing the shapes, just allowing you to quickly cut UVs into meshes in the event that you're using UV coordinate based texturing. So sometimes this case may arise. However, it has been reported that it can affect speed in cases where it's not actually needed. So definitely use this option with caution, but just keep in mind that anytime that you need to have UV supplied to your cutters, you are able to do that via the cutter UV toggle. Anytime I have to produce an ad with box cutter, I simply just take the default cube, scale it down, press D, switch over to custom, activate dots in order to get a face dot, and then we just draw out our shape and just like that, I've created the custom cutter. However, there are some things about the custom cutter that are interesting as, it's, as in its relationship with the bevel modifier. So if we press Q and we add a bevel modifier to this mesh, we see that we have a rather large bevel going. So I'm gonna hold control and draw out the box cutter logo. And we see that the bevel's overshooting a little bit due to the width of the edges of this particular shape. If we were to press Q and go under bevel to adjust it, we see that we're able to adjust the bevel and bring it down to something reasonable. And by pressing Q again and Alt clicking sharpen, we can put a weight at normal, just affecting the shading a little bit more. And if we press Alt V and we turn on the wireframe, we see that the bevel is as dynamic with the shape as it's going to get due to the optimizations that have been made with the box cutter logo in recent releases. So if you use the box cutter logo in your work, just know that we've taken some care to ensure that it works better with the bevel modifier and tries to reduce the amount of artifacting that can be created. Traditionally, whenever you're using Blender, you have one hand on the keyboard and one hand on the mouse. And if you look at your keyboard, you can see that the K key is a little bit far from where your left hand is generally positioned. So generally during box cutter usage, if you wanted to use knife, you just have to reach over and press K. However, if your hand is oriented to the left side of the keyboard, that is a little bit far to reach for this particular maneuver. And for that reason, while drawing a box, pressing Control X will actually toggle between knife on the fly in the event that you're on the left side of the keyboard aiming to get to knife very quickly. In this scene, we have wireframe enabled and we're looking at a situation where bevel didn't quite work out successfully with these randomly placed circles. If I were to press D and switch over to box, you see that we're in cut where I normally am beginning my operation. We can bring in our cut, but we can press control X to quickly jump over to knife, click and apply and complete the operation. Also wanna make sure that hops mark isn't on since that would be detrimental. And because we switched over to knife, you see that we're already in the knife state where I'm able to continue drawing these shapes in order to alleviate the stress that's happening with the bevel and their relationship with these circles. So this is one of the general purposes of using 3D box with knife is to basically alleviate some of the tension that can happen with unoriented geometry as far as edges are concerned with bevel because sometimes bevel will just solve as bevel will resulting in rather skewed edges. If I were to press Q and go under operations and choose clean mesh, we can actually see the solution that Blender actually provides for us. So our goal with blue box is to provide an alternative way for users to draw the geometry that will guide the results of their booleans and bevels, giving them a better shading relationship. So whenever it comes to box cutter, you can switch over to circle by just pressing D and jumping to the helper and changing the circle or just click on the shape and choose circle. By looking at our presets, you would think that we can go between three and 64 segments. However, by clicking on the field, we can actually have manual numerical input. So if we type in something like 256, we see that we're now able to draw a 256 round circle, which is quite heavy. But for those that require it, you're also able to input values as high as 512 in order to create a 512 round circle for those mad lads that require such a thing. Whenever it comes to box cutter and duplicating booleans, if we were to basically draw a shape, but we hold shift in order to shift it to live, underneath the orientation area, there's an option for the BC transformer. By having this enabled, by shift clicking and dragging on a handle, you're able to duplicate booleans along a mesh and keep the connections live. And this also extends to radial array. So starting on this side, I'm just going to draw the box and we'll press VV in order to turn this into a radial array. And we'll also shift this to live. 
If I were to hold shift and drag this gizmo, we see that we're also able to duplicate this radial array for reuse. If I wanted to absolutely position this along this particular face, that's where hard ops would come in. I could press Q, go under mesh tools, choose reset axis, and we could press Y and Z in order to reset the axis for this particular object, allowing us to get it oriented correctly with this particular area. But just want to show that BC Transformer is there in case you need it, but it's one of our older, less, lesser used aspects of box cutters. So definitely turn it off when you're not using it. And it also supports union. So if we were to say draw a shape, press J to turn it into a join, press B to bevel, press Q to Q bevel, maybe shift F to give us a reverse bevel, we can shift this to live and also use the BC Transformer in order to duplicate this union operation as well. So just showing a little bit of the versatility that comes with the BC Transformer, improvements have been made with it over time, but it's definitely there for you in the event that you want to duplicate your booleans. At the top of box cutter is the destructive, non-destructive toggle. By having it set to non-destructive, it ensures that your modifier will be kept after the completion of the operation. Destructive allows the modifier to be removed and applied at the moment of completion. When you tap into edit mode, you're also able to load box cutter. And one of the unique things about box cutter in edit mode is you're able to set your behavior to be destructive. And if you tap back into edit mode or object mode, we see that my behavior is still set to non-destructive. So in one hand, I'm destructive. In one hand, I'm not destructive. And this makes for an interesting workflow where you're able to work in edit mode, cutting shapes destructively, but work in object mode, cutting shapes non-destructively. So sometimes this can come in handy for situations where you want to have kind of a two-handed workflow whenever it comes to box cutter, but definitely an interesting option to take advantage of if you're one of the more advanced users of box cutter. Whenever it comes to rotate inside, we'll need a shape a little more interesting than a box in order to rotate it inside. So I'm going to shift A, add a plane, and we'll just move it over to the side. And I'm just going to begin drawing some box cuts on this plane, cutting all the way through it. We can press Alt-X, mirror it to the other side. And now we have mirror happening. And from here, I'm just going to take this plane and press D and jump over to custom cutter. And we'll just click the plus to make this our custom cutter. So now I'm just going to draw a shape, which is now the shape that we created and begin extruding it. So if we press D, there's an option right here for us to basically rotate the shape inside. However, whenever it comes to hotkeys, you're also able to press shift tilde in order to rotate inside. And you can also press shift R, which will rotate the shape inside. However, whenever it comes to wedge, wedge is a shape level modifier, meaning that we're modifying the actual shape itself on the data and the way it's being translated via the lattice instead of actually rotating the shape inside. So whenever it comes to wedge, wedge is rotated a lot differently. For example, if I wanted this wedge to be on the other side, I could simply press D and go in and jump between the various quick prefs of the wedge to jump it from one side to the other. But you can also rotate it by pressing W. So now I've rotated it to the opposite side and I can still press Shift R to rotate the shape inside. So we do need this greater level of control when it comes to rotating our shapes inside versus rotating our wedge. And for that reason, Shift R is exclusive to rotating the shape inside and adjusting the wedge is its own separate operation. So just by pressing W, I'm able to adjust the wedge and then I can adjust the factor to either be in the middle or be at the very ends whenever it comes to wedge and its relationship with rotate inside. However, I can always click on the rotate inside button in order to rotate the shape inside during this pause mode. Shift R is also used in terms of array. So if I were to just click and drag to create my box and I press V to jump into array, I can press Shift R and that will reset the distance between the array. Sometimes when you change axis, your distance is so far you can't tell exactly where your array is. By pressing Shift R, you're able to reset it. Alternative to pressing Shift R, you can always press D to go inside your helper and change this to something like 0.2 and just begin dragging it and you'll begin bringing your shapes back into focus if you have them so large that they're no longer able to be seen. When it comes to box cutter, one of my favorite hotkeys is the key X. Whenever you're drawing a cut in red, you could press X and convert it into a slice, but you could also press X to jump over to be an intersect modifier, which can be interesting. You could also press X to jump over to inset because sometimes pressing I is just a little too far and pressing X a couple of times is a little bit easier than accidentally pressing the wrong key. You could also press X to jump back to cut operation, basically exiting those three, but just letting users know that X is kind of a multi-key whenever it comes to box cutter. 
In the event you want to linearly jump to a specific operation, you could always press D to bring up the helper. And just by clicking through the options, you're able to change the state of your shape on the fly to whatever state you're trying to get to. So the X hotkey is just there for power users, but just letting users know that X is a multi-use key. But one of my favorites is definitely jumping over to intersect. And to show very briefly how I use it, I will just begin drawing some shapes starting from the corner, press spacebar to apply. We could press Alt X, mirror this to the other side while holding shift to keep it live and just continue just drawing interesting shapes on this particular surface until finally I could press D, jump over to circle and we can just hold control to just start drawing a circle from this particular center dot. And by pressing X twice, I can jump over to basically an intersect and get, turn this into a cylindrical result. And then sometimes I'll follow that up with QOT, press spacebar in order to change that into a cylinder. We could press A in order to adjust the amount of cylinder we're getting, click to apply. And if we delete these two top faces, we could press Q and go under modifier and solidify just creating this really interesting cylindrical shape just built off of a general radial workflow of just playing with a few mirrors. So recut is a type of slice that allows you to cut back data that you've lost. So we'll press X and delete our cylinder and we still have our shape that we heavily modified. I'm gonna look at this from the side view, press numpad five to look at it from orthographic and we can press D and jump into box cutter and begin drawing a box. Now that we have our box, we could press D, jump into the helper and change this over to slice and then click the recap button in order to basically give us back what we lost whenever we initially cut this out. And we still get in here and press B to bevel in order to give ourselves nice beveled edges, click to apply, and now we've basically recut back the area that we previously cut out using difference booleans, not destructive. Inset also supports recut, meaning that if we were to simply draw a little box here and then we change our operation over to inset, we can draw our inset and we can see our inset basically falling apart due to that single box that we cut, just not being able to work out well with our inset. However, we can press D and by activating recut, we can now cut based off of the original mesh instead of the derived mesh that's actually being affected by these modifiers. So sometimes when you are trying to perform an inset that's rather impossible, it's better to base it off of the actual mesh rather than base it off of the modified mesh. And for that reason, inset is also a part of inset. Box cutter contains two knives. If we click on this quick toggle, we are now inside of knife. And whenever we click and drag, we're basically drawing using 3D knife box, which can be a little bit slower whenever it comes to working on more complex meshes. As you can see, as I subsequently keep drawing, it begins lagging just a little bit more due to this being an edit mode operation being transferred to object mode for the convenience of the user. However, there are two knives inside of box cutter. So whenever you begin drawing on a surface, you're using something called 3D box. However, if we orient ourselves to view and we begin drawing off of the mesh, we're actually using something called knife project, which is actually a lot faster and can come in handy for times where you just need to quickly perform a knife operation without any further ado. So just drawing off of the mesh and orienting yourself to view can definitely trigger a much faster knife, just letting users know that there is a big difference between 2D knife and 3D knife. Box cutter supports the use of fonts being used as custom cutters. However, it does come with a few caveats. Let's shift A and add a text object and we will just type in font. And from here, let's just press D, jump over to custom and we'll click this plus icon to mark this text as a custom cutter. So now whenever I click and drag, I'm now drawing using this font that we have over on the side. In fact, I can go over here and type in something else like box press C in order to mark it as my custom cutter again, just because I am classic. And in the event that we want to rotate this inside, we could always press shift R to rotate the shape inside or shift tilde to rotate the shape inside, or even press D and click on the rotate inside button to rotate the shape inside while the operation is running. So we will just click and apply. From here, I will shift A, insert a curve circle, and we'll press GX and move the circle over to the side. And I could press control tilde and hard ops to go under the curve settings and we could change our shape to basically be 2D and our fill mode to be both, giving us a solid shape. From here, I'm just gonna select one corner and press V and change it to vector, giving us this teardrop shape that we can just move around. And from here, I'm gonna press C to mark this as my custom cutter. And as you can see, I'm able to draw this teardrop shape using this as my custom cutter. Previously, I was talking about my superstition with marking shapes as a custom cutter. So with this curve, instead of pressing C, I'm gonna go in edit mode 
and press V, change one of the handles to vector, and we're just gonna try drawing it again. And we see that the shape automatically updates when we make changes to this particular curve. So just like that, you're able to use curves inside of Boss Cutter by marking them as the custom cutter. Whenever it comes to box cutter and the operation slice, there's an option called apply slices that's able to be toggled on. And when this is used, whenever you draw a slice, the slice will have its modifiers applied, but the target will not have its modifiers applied. And this means that you can do something like recall the cutter and scale it up in order to give some additional boundary to your shape and take it in a unique direction like box cutting it as well in order to get a rather unique result. But just letting users know that apply slices will apply your slice but keep it live on your target for further editing. When it comes to box cutter and sculpting, we tiptoe around the topic until it gets fast enough. However, if we were to take this shape, scale it up and press Q and jump over to sculpt mode, we could press Q and choose to voxelize this mesh. So I'm going to control click it first in order to adjust my grid. And then from there, I'm just gonna click voxelize in order to voxelize this mesh. However, we see that we didn't apply our scale prior. So things came out a little bit wonky. So I'm gonna apply my scale and then jump back into sculpt mode. And from here, let's just control click voxelize and we see that it's a lot better than it was before. And let's head to something like 0 0.2031. And then from here, voxelize our shape and we get a result like this. So if we were to go into object mode and jump over to slice and we have apply slices enabled just for simplicity's sake. And we press X because we forgot that we set ourselves to slice and we perform a couple of slices and if we were to simply take one of these pieces back over to sculpt mode and we control click voxelize, we see that we're still on the same value as before. So voxelization values are kept in between slices in the event that you're using sculpt mode and voxelization in order to ensure that you're able to get the exact values you want consistently across all of your parts. So whenever you're working in box cutter, if you were to create a series of shapes and cuts on a surface and you find yourself liking them enough to want to repeat them, you can simply draw a shape around it and press Y in order to extract this surface and it'll show a nice fade for the extraction. And after jumping you over to custom, which it automatically does, you're able to draw this custom shape that you extracted repeatedly using shift R to rotate inside and adjust the shape to your liking to get it oriented to the surface to repeat it in the fashion that you like. However, if we press control N and we make a new scene, let's right click and subdivide. And we're just gonna grab this point and use hard op circle to create a circle for this area. And we'll press E, S, scale it in, E, and continue scaling. And if we shift click sharpen, we're able to get this shaded nicely. And if we press D, we're already inside of box. So we're just gonna start off cutting it out I prefer to actually cut these things out in red so I see exactly what I'm cutting. And then from there, pressing Y to jump over to extraction. By clicking and applying, we see that we're now able to repeat this mesh extraction that was actually hand modeled in by ourselves and repeat this in the form of a non-destructive Boolean. So there are some ways that you can convert your very modeling to cutters that's able to be reused through box cutter or even saved out externally and reused via kit ops. The easiest way to demonstrate this in action is to shift D and move this cube over and we can press S, Y to scale it in. And I'm gonna press Control R, add a loop cut, and we'll just grab these side edges and dissolve them. I'm gonna grab this single edge up top, press Control B to bevel, and then in face mode, after pressing three, I can extrude this face up. So this will be our custom cutter. We'll press D to jump over to custom, and we'll mark this as our custom cutter. If we go to join, we see that there's an option for flip Z, which means that if we draw this shape out, in the join operation, we see that it's oriented like so. However, if we right click and cancel, we can click on flip Z and we'll actually flip the Z direction of the object, allowing us to draw it a little differently than previous. Sometimes with make and join, you need a little bit of additional versatility. And for that reason, they are both bi-directional, meaning that you can drag them both directions and they will still be able to maintain their shape without issue. For example, if we change over to cut, we see that cut is also bi-directional because we started from make. But if we were to jump simply over to cut, we are not able to basically extrude the opposite direction because these are limitations of the cut system. However, if we jump over to join, we see that we're able to draw it both directions. And the same thing goes with make. If we press A to turn this into a make object that has no boolean, you see that we're able to drag this arrow both directions, turning a down vote into an up vote. Sometimes in box cutter, you might find yourself with a modifier stack that's configured to be so heavy that you're unable to progress properly whenever it comes to cutting. For example, I'm drawing this circle 
and we see that the extrusion is just taking so long and it really doesn't help that we have 512 segments on this circle either. So let's set that to something like 32, but let's jump over to box. So if I were to draw a box, we see that the box is actually quite slow with this particular operation. So this is a time in which you may want to introduce pause to your workflow. So by toggling pause mode to be active, or toggling live to be off, we see that we're able to work in box cutter with a degree of fluidity that wasn't available to us before whenever things were lagging. So by clicking, we see that the speed hit is then offset to the end of the operation, allowing us to work with a degree of speed and control that was unavailable to us whenever we were trying to deal with the mesh and its heaviness. Traditionally, whenever you draw a shape, we see that the shape is solid with the color of the operation, but the wireframe is shaded to be black for visibility. If we press Control K, we can go into the box cutter preferences via the hard ops preferences. And looking at the option of wire, there's a toggle that allows us to use the mode color. And what this means is that whenever you draw, you'll see that the shape color of the wireframe is actually colored the same way as the mode that's being used at hand. So sometimes this is something you may want, but in the event that you don't want it, you could always press Control K to go into your preferences to toggle this off to draw a shape with a traditional black outline color. Traditionally with box cutter, whether you're using dynamic grid or you're drawing shapes, there's a certain fade time that's applicable to all of our systems. So if we expand on the behavior drop down and we go to display, we see that we can set a fade time. So I'll set it to something like 300 and we'll set our out time to something like 600. And now we see that whenever we draw the shape, it fades in. And then we click to complete, it fades out. You can even set this to something like 1200 and get a really large fade time, which allows you to draw multiple shapes and have them fade at the same time, which can be a really interesting visual experience. Extractions can also have their fades adjusted. For example, right now we have extraction out set to 700. This means if I were to draw a box around this area and press Y to extract, we will see this for basically seven milliseconds. But if we set this to something like 1200 and we change our shape back to box because it sets you up to custom once you extract and we press Y, we see that the shape can stay around for a little bit longer. Whenever it comes to grid, there's also fade settings that are for that and dots as well. So we see that with grid, it comes in at zero speed, meaning it comes in instantaneously. However, we could set this to something like 20 and we can set the exit fade to something like 600, which means that the grid will take a brief moment to come into view, but also take a brief moment to exit whenever we release control, which can make for a more graceful experience whenever it comes to using box cutter. So definitely get in there and set up your fade parameters to be something a little more advantageous to your experience. Fade also extends to dynamic dots, but not to static dots. So whenever we're looking at dots, we can set ourselves up with something like 600 on the exit timing for dots. And then whenever we release, whenever we release control, we see that they fade out very nicely. So there's a lot of functionality whenever it comes to fade, but it is one of those things that I find that I just can't live without. And I'm always glad to see it expand further inside of box cutter. When it comes to adjusting the fade of box cutter, you can also use it to trigger sound effects. For example, by going under the out fade and setting it to something like one, two, three, we see that the settings have advanced a little bit, but now whenever we draw a shape, it will now perform a nice sound. So this can come in handy for times where you just want sound feedback to occur, but you may have noticed that after I perform my first sound, it stopped making sound. For this reason, we've enabled the ability for users to change their audio device driver inside of Blender in order to ensure that sounds play every single time because sometimes sounds will actually be cut out due to the settings of Blender and differences between the various audio libraries. And with the next button, you can actually change over to different types of sound effects to experience all the sound effects that Box Cutter has to offer. Of course, keep in mind that sound effects are exclusive to very particular numerical values, which is why the next and previous buttons were added. But in your general experience, more than likely you shouldn't even run across sound effects unless you happen to fall upon one of these very specific values that you see me scrolling between. Generally, whenever new users begin using box cutter, pressing D will bring up the legacy pie or basically the pie that we first had whenever we first began setting up box cutter in 2.8. However, over time, underneath the behavior panel and underneath display, we've added options for simple pie, which is basically a more streamlined pie aimed for getting you to shaped very quickly. However, all of our pies are being beaten by the new input D key helper of the new box helper that's been added as a box cutter 718 underscore nine. So when it comes to dealing with box cutter, I definitely recommend enabling the box helper and using that to get around box cutter since the best in everything that box cutter contains is almost contained entirely in this one window. 
Whenever it comes to box cutter, in the event that you're drawing a box and you press W to turn it into a wedge, your next box cut will also be a wedge, and your next box cut after that will also be a wedge. However, you can always press W before even extruding in order to turn off wedge from taking place in the event that you don't want wedge on a particular cut. However, even though taper is in the same category as wedge, it isn't very much like it. For example, when we enable wedge and we choose a factor like 0.5 to draw a shape, when we click to apply and then we draw another shape, we see that this shape does not have taper attached to it. And that's because taper is typically viewed as a one-time operation. However, if you go to tapers options and you click the persistence button, you can actually have taper persist across operation, across operation being permanently on as you're working with box cutter. When it comes to box cutter, modifiers are referred to as start states, and then the shape modifiers are referred to as shape modifiers on a different level. So whenever it comes to box cutter, you can have one start state operational at a time, which is basically a modifier. However, you can have all these start states enabled whenever it comes to shape modifiers. So just keep in mind that whenever you're using box cutter, you can have multiple shape states active, but when it comes to start states in the terms of modifiers, you can only have one of them active at, at one time. So here, I'll activate array, which means that whenever I draw my box, I'm drawing out an array box. We could press D and go in our helper and adjust our parameters. So even though we can't start with multiple operations, we can do things like press the hotkey of B in order to bevel during this operation. We could press T to solidify. And if we press D, we see that we have multiple operations or modifiers started at the same time for this particular shape that we can go in and edit. So we are able to add them throughout the operation, but when it comes to using them as a start state, you aren't able to add these in rapid succession unless the drawing has already began. However, whenever it comes to your start state, as far as shape modifiers go, you can have all of these active in addition to being able to toggle them in the middle of working. So just keep that in mind and you'll be able to get the most out of your experience. However, the locket icon at the top refers to having no start state, indicating that you're just drawing a pure shape. And then you can go in and do things like say, add a bevel, go into viewport, start adjusting it, go in and choose to add a Q bevel, reverse bevel, click and apply. And just like that, we've now drawn a bevel shape, but we see that array is still our default state. So if we right click and we press D, we can see that array is listed. And then by clicking the X, we've jumped our start state back to nothing, meaning that whenever we draw a box, we are drawing just a simple box. So generally, whenever you're working, you can assign a color to your collections by just right clicking them and just choosing a color. However, if you use the D helper and you decide to change the collection color of your cutters collection, you can see that you're able to do it here and it'll also update the collection in real time. Whenever it comes to the remesh modifier, we do take care to ensure that it's placed after booleans whenever you have sorting enabled for it. So if we expand behavior, we see that there's an option for sort remesh. And by enabling it, we see that we're now able to cut and it will be sorted before the remesh. So just in case you're one of those types of users trying to use the remesh with box cutter, just know that we have settings both in hard ops and box cutter for users to be able to have remesh be sorted prior to the Boolean operation. So hooks are one of the more interesting and one of my favorite aspects of Blender. If we tab in edit mode, we can press three and select this top face. And if we press control H, we can choose hook to new object. And now in object mode, we can just grab this empty and move it in order to adjust just that top face, just allowing us a little bit of dynamic control with this form. In the event that you're using the hook modifier in terms with box cutter, we will also support that as well, allowing you to still be able to grab your empty and make modifications but also be able to still continue to draw on the shape and not have to worry about any sort of issues happening with your data being lost. Whenever it comes to box cutter, we have quite a few operations mapped to the mouse wheel. For example, if we were to press B to add a bevel, we can roll the wheel to adjust the segments of our bevel. However, we can also use the arrow keys to adjust the segments on our bevel on the fly. Another example is if we were to draw a box and we press V to add an array, we could press up and down in order to adjust our count. In addition to moving our mouse to adjust our distance, we can still use the arrow keys to adjust our count. If we were to go into mirror, we draw a shape, we can press one to activate mirror, press two to activate Y mirror, press three to activate Z mirror, and we still have the flexibility to be able to move our shape around even inside of this mirror. Keep in mind that anytime you need to edit these settings intimately, you are able to go inside the box helper to access your modifier settings. Another one I wanna talk about is solidify. If we press T, we see that pressing the arrow keys does nothing because basically you press T and you move the mouse in order to adjust your solidification. But when it comes to the crucial operations, like being able to 
deal with your bevel, we do support arrow keys. And also whenever you're recalling shapes, you're also able to use arrow keys for that. When it comes to box cutter, our goal was to add the box helper as a way to centralize everything in box cutter and reduce the amount of hotkeys used. And as a result, everything that you can do in box cutter is basically accessible from the helper. This means that I can hold control, begin drawing out on this dot, press tab, press D, go inside the helper, activate array, set up my array in the viewport, click to pause, go back in the helper, choose to turn it into a radial array, control roll over the count in order to adjust the count and adjust the distance without having to jump back into the operation. I'm also able to click on bevel in order to just activate bevel and jump into the viewport to make adjustments without having to press any of the hotkeys. In fact, when it comes to box cutter, there are only two hotkeys at this time that I feel are unaddressed by the helper, and that is H for wireframe and L for shift to live. So basically, these are the only two hotkeys that are unaddressed by the helper. So if you're using box cutter and using the helper, these are the only two hotkeys that you need to worry about. When using box cutter, you have the ability to map any of the modifiers to the hotkey of shift by clicking on this area here. So we can actually set shift to be taper, which is this default operation, meaning that when we draw a shape and we're on the extrude, if we hold shift and begin moving the mouse, we're actually adjusting the taper reducing the need for us to have to press T. So if you find yourself in a repetition workflow where you're having to use the same thing over and over at various stages, sometimes it can come in handy just being able to draw out your shapes and use shift in order to make adjustments. Of course, watch out with holding shift because you can also activate shift to live accidentally. So you definitely want to release shift before the operation ends in order to preserve your shapes being hidden after the operation unless you personally want them to be shifted to live but just letting users know that any operation can basically be mapped to shift through the operations area so we can also map this to bevel meaning that when we draw a shape we just hold shift and we're able to adjust the bevel click and be done and we can just activate this on the fly as needed without even having to press the hotkey of b to activate bevel and making bevel our permanent start state so it's just a different way to work but it definitely comes in handy for times where you need to perform the same operation over and over, but you don't want to actually have to press the hotkeys in order to do it. You may just want to just tap shift and move your mouse in order to make affections to the particular modifier without having to go into the helper or make any further adjustments via key presses. So whenever you're working in box cutter, you're able to draw shape and press B to bevel. You're also able to press Q in order to Q bevel. And we see that the type of bevel that we received is what's called a quad bevel. However, if we right click and cancel and we go under our operations and enable bevel, we can go in our bevel parameters and toggle off quad bevel. And whenever we draw a shape, we'll actually be able to see what the difference is between a quad bevel and a generic bevel. So just letting users know that in the event you want your bevels to come out a little bit more traditional, you're also able to do that. However, by default, quad bevel should be enabled, ensuring that whenever you draw a Q bevel on your shape, it will come out with a nice rounded corner as a result of the quad beveling. So when Blender is first installed and set up, pressing tilde will bring up the view pie, meaning that you can click on various options in order to orient your view on the fly whenever it comes to using Blender. So this is something we wanted to also utilize inside of box cutter to the fullest. So by pressing tilde inside of draw, you're able to change your orientation just on the fly. However, in the event that you don't like the view pie and you don't want it to be showing during box cutter, there's also an option to toggle that off as well. So if you click on the behavior sprocket and we expand input, we see that there's an option for view pie. And by toggling this off, it means that whenever we press tilde, nothing will actually pop up on the screen. And finally, kind of one of the more random things is if you were to basically press control spacebar, you can go into kind of a full screen mode, but pressing control shift spacebar will play the timeline, but control alt spacebar will take you to maximum full screen. Sometimes in this mode, you actually begin to miss the top bar. So by pressing alt W, the box cutter hotkey, you can actually bring back the top bar inside of this full screen mode. And of course you can always exit by pressing control alt spacebar to get out of it. But just in case you ever miss your top bar when you're working in this full screen isolate mode, just pressing alt W, the box cutter hotkey will bring back the top bar.